Great. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for joining Yawande and I. We are currently in Davis, like near Sacramento in California, but we're so excited that all over the world joining us to talk about some women's soccer trivia. Um, this is also really exciting for us because not that it's like our launch or anything close to women in soccer, but it's kind of like our first kickoff extravaganza, if you will, to kind of introduce our new organization that's going to be amazing um, for all different communities. Um, so Women in Soccer is a network um, on a mission to connect all women who love the beautiful game. So whether you're on the field or you're cheering from the stands, work in the business or want to be in the business or just a passionate change maker, our network is here to support you. So our formal launch is going to be November 11th, but membership is free. So remember that when that happens. Um, but before then, you can go ahead and sign up on our website and follow us on social media, which we'll share with you. Um, and that way you'll be able to stay updated with all things women in soccer. Awesome. All right. So our trivia, um, oh, really quickly, obviously, I'm supposed to introduce myself um, <laughs> as if I'm like that big of a deal that people know me. Okay. So um, I am the head women soccer coach at UC Davis. Um, I am one of two American women uh, that have a UEFA A license. I went to Wales the past few years. Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, I'm Kind of sad to report, but also excited about the opportunity um, that I, I'm part of the 1% of females in the world that have a UFA license. And obviously our goal is to increase that number and that percentage as much as possible. Um, I did my undergrad at Berkeley. Um, I am a total nerd, so I have two master's degrees also. Um, and I am a former professional player in the WPS, which is um, obviously now defunct, and we can celebrate the NWSL and all the success that it has had the past few years. I will let Yawande introduce herself as well. That's me. Um, that picture doesn't even look like me anymore. Uh, okay, well, I am Grace's assistant here at Davis. Um, I hold a USSF C license. I also have a United Soccer Coaches goalkeeping diploma, but I should put that there as well. Um, don't have as many degrees, but I uh, have a marketing degree and an MBA from the University of Maryland. And I did play semi-pro um, with the Ottawa Fury and W League and with the Washington Freedom <laughs> back in the day <laughs> in the W League as well. So there, there's me. Awesome. Let's get this yeah. going with the trivia. Yes. So the trivia, um, we're hoping that it's just going to be kind of fun and thought provoking and just a really good conversation starter to kind of highlight why women in soccer and the organization is essential for not just, you know, the United States, but also hopefully globally. Um, we'd love for you to share your thoughts and opinions in the chat. And we'll try to kind of address everybody as we talk through some of the highlights. Um, we didn't include any references to some of the statistics on the, the slides, but feel free to ask and I can provide where we got this information from um, at the end of our presentation. Um, but we're gonna go through kind of three categories that Yawande and I felt like are really just close to our heart um, and that we identify with in a lot of ways. Um, and the first one up is gonna be media and marketing. Cool, all right. So this is basically just a quick snapshot of women's sports in general and you know how it might relate back to the women's soccer industry as a whole. But our first question is, women make up 40% of all participants in sports. What percentage of women's sports receive media coverage? We'll go ahead and give you all a couple seconds to- Feel free to put your, your answer in the chat, chat. or you wanna yell it out loud on your, your, on your, your screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's D, you guys. <laughs> yeah, um, it's somehow, yeah, women only receive 4% of sports media coverage. Um, and you kind of see that too with the NWSL uh, Challenge Cup this summer, right? Only the semifinals and uh, the championship were aired on ESPN News and ESPN2, not even on, you know, any of the main platforms or channels. So that was, you know, kind of a tough thing for us to see, you know, the rest of the games were on CBS all access, which you had to pay for. Like, I don't think 
that would ever have happened with, I mean, it doesn't happen with the MLS, right? Um, definitely a bit of an issue. Um, we'll go on to question two before we go into more conversation. <laughs> All right, so second question is, what percentage of sports sponsorship dollars goes to women's sports? Give you a few minutes to put in your answer. All right, Chris, you are um, not wrong. So the answer is 1%. So it gets it gets 3% of print and 4% of online coverage goes to women's own women's only sport, but less than 20% of all TV sport covers women, right? And so it's very, very bad news because that means that the sponsorship dollars ends up being 1%. And this is obviously devastating for a lot of ways, which is why we're highlighting that. Um, there are luckily some changes being made, which is really nice. Um, the UEFA Women's Football kind of league, FIFA, has now put a seven-year deal with Visa. So there are some organizations and obviously Budweiser and some other sponsors have started to look at um, the women's game more closely which is fantastic. Um, but I think for me, um, one of the biggest problems is that, you know, it's not necessarily the, the decisions that the sponsors are making aren't, aren't based on facts, <laughs> like science isn't a thing or facts aren't a thing, which um, shouldn't exist. But um, it's more of like a cultural bias um, at this point. And so we're hopeful that um, you know, as women's sports become more popular um, and there's more media coverage, then obviously sponsors will start to invest more dollars um, in women's sports in general. So we'll hop on to the next question and continue the conversation. Oh, I guess this is just a kind of quick discussion questions uh, for you all. Oh, next topic. You said no. Nope. Monday. Oh, okay. I thought, okay. I was like, did I miss something? Okay. Um, <laughs> so quick discussion question. Um, how does the lack of media coverage affect the growth of the women's game worldwide? If anyone wants to, you know, kind of chime in with their thoughts on it, feel free. Lizzie, if you want to chat, you can, you can chat as well. <laughs> I'm the only one sharing my video. Okay. So, <laughs> this, this can be based in just like opinion also. So how do you feel like the lack of media coverage might affect the growth of the women's game? Um, and this could be from like a personal experience or maybe an experience that you have with your club or organization. Um, any thoughts on that? Carrie Taylor brings up a good point. Don't women have 85% of spending power? Is that interesting? We have spending power yet, not a lot of coverage. Mm -hmm. So less coverage, I would say less people, right? Less women watching the game maybe even. Right, and that's kind of that's something cool. that we think exactly what you said, Chris, right? If you can't see it, you can't be it. So you've got all these young women that play soccer, you know, that play sports, that if they can't see themselves, um, you know, performing or executing something because um, they don't have access to it and it's not available, then it's really, really difficult, obviously, to want to be a part of that or to, you know, take steps in that direction. So exactly, Carrie, what you said, it's not even about being a player or being a coach, um, which are probably two of the most visible pieces of the game. It's also knowing that you can be an owner, you could be a broadcaster, you can be a journalist of that sport, you can be, um, you know, you can involve yourself in the game in other ways outside of just being an actual participant. So. Um, I think um, another important thing to note is that just even in terms of viewership, you know, there's this misconception that um, most people only have an interest in men's sports. Um, but according to Nielsen, we got a couple of sources here, 84% um, of sports fans have an interest in women's sports. 51% of those are men. So I think just changing that 
idea around what people actually want to see, you know, within the media kind of helps us change the narrative around women's sports and that coverage. Absolutely. Right. So like the brands, they don't necessarily need to just target women's sports um, and like female demographics, right? Like male demographic also is going to be just as engaged or want to see women's media coverage and, and invest also their time and their, hopefully their dollars um, into growing the game for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think something really interesting um, and I, I don't ever want to get caught in like comparing like men's sports versus women's sports because we're doing our own thing and we're going to make it awesome. Um, but I do want to highlight this because I do think it's kind of cool. Um, is that when the NWSL during the Challenge Cup, um, they set a record and they had 653,000 people watch the final game. Um, and the MLS's first game back, um, their opening game started with 492,000 viewers compared to 572,000 viewers who watched the Challenge Cup debut. So on opening day, the women almost had, you know, roughly 80,000 more viewers than the women did, or sorry, than the men did, which I think is, that's pretty powerful. It's a powerful statement. That means that there's investment from communities and, um, you know, I hope sponsors and the media take note of that and continue to grow it. Um, any other final thoughts before we move on to our next category? Absolutely. Okay. All right. On to the next one. All right. So this category is about coaching at the pro and the college levels. And again, we're just highlighting some of kind of, you know, the, the different inequities that exist within the game and hopefully again, starting a conversation to find ways to improve, um, improve our, just the awareness. So uh, the first question is in 2017 to 2018, former U.S. Women's National Team coach Jill Ellis was the blank highest paid coach in the U.S. Soccer Federation. So this is men's and women's um, U.S. soccer. All right, this one was a stumper then. All right, very good. The actual answer, you guys were uh, a little wrong. It's actually the fifth. Um, so Jill Jill Ellis made roughly $320,000 while the men's under 20 head coach and the senior assistant coach made between three hundred forty-five and 365000 um, Bruce Arena, I don't know if you remember this, he was there for about a year and a half as like kind of an interim, and he made $1.4 million. And at the time, in 2017, uh, Jurgen Klinsmann was the head men's coach, and he made over $3 million. So there's obviously a massive discrepancy there. Um, and just kind of a highlight, because a lot of you picked D, which is the 10th. Um, in 2017, 2018, Jill Ellis was the fifth highest paid coach but she was the 10th highest paid um, employee at U.S. Soccer. So that means that there was like chairmen and presidents and administrators that were actually paid more than her, even though she won like World Cups and gold medals and things, but no big deal, right? <laughs> anyway. All right, next question. Okay, question two. What percentage of NCAA D1 women's college soccer head coaches are women? Yeah, a lot of people between C and D. It's actually D. Um, not that many out of the, what, 333 teams. 29% um, of those coaches are 
women. Yes. And so of the 64 teams that competed in the 2019 Division I tournament, only 19 of those teams are currently coached by women. Um, so if you think about it as well, we talk about, um, you know, hiring power, 1.2% of all athletic directors in Division One in 2019. Um, oh, Sorry, that was not what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> not yeah. that one. Um, yeah, so actually one, yeah, sorry. But 84%, sorry, of athletic directors were white men. Um, so that was what I was looking for. Um, but again, we talk about those people that are in power that are hiring those, right? It's tough for us to, you know, get into those positions if, you know, it turns into a bit of a and you know a boys club sometimes but we're working on that i think those percentages have been changing over the years not very quickly but it's happening right exactly um okay so next question um how many head coaches in the nwsl are female and out of that number or sorry not out of the number second part of the question is out of 36 um, how many coaching positions are filled by women? So there's 36 coaching roles in the NWSL, and how many of those are filled by women? I thought this was a good one. I was like, this is going to get some people for sure. Because <laughs> I didn't even know this. Um, so, very cool. Um, all right. So, the answer is C. So, there is one full time coach. She is at Sky Blue. And I guess. Kind of midway through, I don't wasn't really like a season, but uh, there's one interim that just kind of started a couple months ago when there was a big situation in Utah Royals and they had to um, make some changes to their staff. So one full time and there's one interim. So it was kind of a trick question, but one. Um, and then out of 36 total possible roles, um, yeah, there's only eight women that are filling those roles as like assistant coaches or technical staff which is pretty, pretty disappointing. Um, so kind of the final thought implications and opportunities in, again, discussion for you in the chat, or if you want to come on video and share your thoughts, um, is why, why is the, why is there a shortage of women in coaching? And this is obviously, there's lots of different reasons and factors that go into this, but maybe if you have a personal experience or something that you'd like to share, that would be great. But yeah, what are, what are your thoughts? I think it's important to have a model to aspire to. If you don't see something in action, you just don't think it's a possibility. Um, so we have to have those models so we can aspire to, to be that and also have the opportunity. Um, I think women are pulled in so many directions, whether that's like raising families and doing all of these other things in addition to their job. Um, so making sure that women have the opportunity and the model is missing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, Carrie. Yeah. Um, I, what, right, um, what Yawande was trying to find, we have lots of notes, obviously, <laughs> Um, is that 84.5% of athletic directors are, are white men and only 13.6% are women. Um, and of that, which is where Yawande was going, only 1.2 of those 13.6 are black women. And so again, it kind of goes back to if you can't see it, it's hard to be it, right? And um, you know, when you're looking at the pipeline of how the trajectory of women trying to get different you know, jobs in coaching, um, you really do have to change the minds of the people that are in actually positions to hire women um, and then give them the tools to actually retain their talent. 
uh, which is really, really difficult. I also think that there's a cultural bias that goes into it, right, where there is a glass ceiling and it's really rare to find women in head coaching jobs because I think that it's assumed that men are just better until women prove themselves, right? Like men don't necessarily have to prove themselves, but women certainly do. And they're under a different type of microscope, um, which isn't necessarily an inviting environment to be in. It can be really difficult to kind of manage and sustain that and want to put yourself out there and, you know, be kind of criticized. And like I said, under a microscope. So um, this is this is a little bit outdated now, but I'm assuming that hasn't changed that much. But um, according to FIFA uh, data in 2014, women coaches account for only 7% of licensed soccer coaches worldwide. So earlier I had said that 1% have a UEFA A license, um, women. And I mean, that, that was recent. That was two years ago um, that that percentage came out. And so 7% might be closer to 8% now. Um, but think about that. Only 8% of women worldwide are licensed. Um, and obviously that goes to, you know, that could be, again, just based on the environment, based on access. It's also really expensive. Um, but I do think that, you know, if, if players aren't also having positives, this is going to go into our next category. But if, if female players aren't having great experiences and are not coached by women, um, it's not necessarily something that they want to invest their time in moving forward after they're done playing collegiately or playing a high school or club. I was going to say that those last few points were a perfect segue into that next section there, that next set of questions. Um, so that is going from playing into coaching, right? And those transitions from female players going into coaching and also the intersectionality, right, of being a female and also being Black or a woman of color. Um, so that first question is, um, in 2019, what percentage of players in NCAA Division I soccer identify as Black? Give you another couple of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, you're closer to the right answer. The answer is actually A. Okay, and that um, percentage has actually gone up only 1% in the past like six years or so, um, which is, yeah, kind of crazy to think about um, according to um, the NCAA in 2018, there were 660 black female division one soccer players. It's not a lot. <laughs> um, and that, that, if you break that down, right, there's like 330 ish, right. Um, division one teams. That means that there's like two, two black women per team, which that's honestly a little is, less is insane two. out of like a 30 person roster typically. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, um, all right, next question along the same lines. In 2020, what percentage of players in the NWSL are black or identify as black, we should say? I love it. Good. Um, well, this is basically a kind of a direct correlation. It's almost identical uh, to the NCAA. So in 2020, uh, there's 32 per, uh, black players listed on NWS rosters, which makes up 7.5% of the league. So very, very identical almost um, to the NCAA. So um, that kind of moves us into our last question, which again are implications and opportunities. Um, so what are the potential causes and effects 
of the disparity in playing and coaching demographics at the collegiate and professional levels? And then how may the lack of diversity at the playing level impact the diversity in other facets of the game, like coaching? We'd love some voices. Yeah. I was going to say really quick too, um, you know, we talked a little bit about that representation piece and, you know, not seeing it. So not really wanting to become it, you know, in 2019, um, there were only two black female head coaches in NCAA division one. Right. So, you know, not really seeing yourself in that role, like there's not really that desire necessarily that's, you know, brought out of people to want to go and continue coaching. Um, and then Tim had a question about youth soccer and outreach and recruiting. Um, probably both, yes, um, given the fact that to play youth soccer in this country is so very expensive at this point, right? So it's become a very middle-class sport. Um, that changes the, the demographics already, just the nature of it being a middle-class sport. It's also like a very suburban sport, right? Um, in a lot of ways, it's difficult to get fields or even have fields. There's, you know, I, I know some of you are in New York and you're familiar with how difficult it might be to rent a field or get space and you're training in like a 10 by 10 area of one field. Um, and obviously suburban areas um, that typically have different demographics than city areas, um, you know, have more access to fields or better fields. Um, and then the cost of travel. So like Yuande mentioned, there's just, there's less access. And that's some, that's a common theme when you're, you know, talking about diversity at large in American soccer is how expensive it is to get involved. And unfortunately, the, the higher levels that you, you move up in terms of, you know, talent and commitment, the more expensive it can be because of the travel required to, you know, get good competition. Um, but, you know, generally there's just fewer opportunities afforded to female soccer players overall, which means it's much more difficult for women to stay involved after the game, um, especially after college. So, right. And yeah. the same way that, my last you know, piece men, oh, I was going to say the same way that, you know, there are so many men coaching in the women's game. That's not necessarily the same for women coaching, you know, on the men's side. Right. So those jobs aren't necessarily open for us to, to step into those roles and then especially with the head coaches on the women's side, like so many people stay in those jobs for five, seven, 10 years at a time. So those jobs aren't necessarily opening up as often as well. And again, with the, you know, the people that are doing the hiring, they're not necessarily always looking for those women to take those roles. So again, that access on, you know, a lot of levels is, is kind of what's holding us back a little bit, but, you know, we're looking to find ways to make those changes. So. Yeah, and something I, I we should have put this stat in here. I'm sorry we didn't, but um, it, it's it's not necessarily promising. But at least there's <laughs> we can leave this on like semi positive note. And this is specific to the women's college game. Is that obviously there's only 29% of Division One coaches are women um, head coaches, but I believe the number of assistant coaches is significantly higher. It's way over, well over 50%. It's like 65%, yeah. um, somewhere between 55 and 65. So. For me, I mean, that's like at least a step in the right direction where male coaches are wanting to hire uh, female assistants because there's only like a handful of all female staffs. Um, we're one of them at UC Davis. Um, I believe there's only four, like four or five in the whole country that have all women as staff. Um, and so that means that of those, you know, 70% of male coaches that are head coaches, there's a really big percentage that are hiring women to be their assistant coaches. And I think if you look at the next like 10 to 15 years, um, and I mean this in the nicest, most respectful way, but once some of those male coaches age out of their positions that they've been at for 20 to 30 years now, that there'll be a huge wave of women, you know, female assistant coaches that are gonna get those opportunities. Um, that now have experience in the game, they have experience coaching, rather than hiring a young male coach, they'll hire an experienced female coach that's been given those opportunities to understand how NCAA works and, um, you know, that are more, I guess, more qualified then. Um, and that will be considered um, what 
you know, before they go into like the, the, the hiring situation. So I'm hopeful that that's the direction that we're going. So it's really exciting when we go to tournaments and recruit to see so many women on the sidelines because historically, even 10 years ago, that was not the case. It was, you know, an anomaly for women to be on the sideline um, watching players and, and to be involved. So, um, uh, Tim, there are not any rules. Um, I, I mean, I think it's preferred. I think a lot of departments and athletic directors are encouraging, um, coaches of women's teams to hire women. Um, and yeah, Carrie, that's exactly right. The Tucker center has really, really good statistics on this. This is where we got the majority of our information for today. Um, but yeah, there, there's certainly encouraging, uh, women's sports to hire females for different, you know, positions. Um, Unfortunately, I think that sometimes women aren't necessarily qualified for those roles and they get hired because they are women, um, which doesn't necessarily help the cause. Um, but there are certainly many qualified women that get overlooked. Um, but again, I think this goes back to, I think either Carrie or Rachel put this in the chat, is that we have to provide opportunities for women to, um, to be mentored and to receive the type of information and feedback that's gonna help them be successful and to put them in the right situation that will help them stay involved in the game. Um, and that's definitely something that is part of this Women in Soccer organization is to set each other up for success. So whether you're again, a coach or a player or um, you know some part of the game, um, we wanna provide opportunities and networks and ability to really develop as an individual and develop whatever role it is that you want to be and feel supported is probably the most important part of this organization. And that's people from all different, you know, demographics and communities and different relationships with the game. Um, that there's, there's mentors and there's role models and there's people that want to hire you and there's people that want to invest in your success and help you and, and empower you and give you an autonomy to become everything that you're capable of being. So, um, we love where this organization's going and we're, we're really, you know, hopeful that everyone that jumped on this today is going to spread the word for us. Um, obviously you can follow us on social media. Um, and Yawande uh, had mentioned earlier that our, our launch date is going to be November 11th. Um, and there are free membership, um, and different tiers, which are going to be really exciting to look at, but we want, everyone to be a part of this and to invest in yourself, invest in each other. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if there's any final thoughts, we'd love that. But other than that, we'll wrap up. Awesome. Thanks so much, Yuande and Tracy. Thank you so much, everyone.